morning, everyone. I work uh, part-time out of Jackson, Michigan uh, for Consumers Energy. We're an energy utility company uh, providing natural gas and electricity to the state of Michigan. Uh, I specifically work in the gas storage department. So uh, everybody here is probably fairly fam familiar with that. Uh, we have 15 gas storage reservoirs, uh, 13, or excuse me, 12 of which are Niagara and Reef reservoirs. I use the term Niagara. Uh, that's the nomenclature we have in Michigan. I think you guys use Guelph uh, for your reefs, but we're talking about the same, same timing of dep deposition um, in same sort of pinnacle reef reservoirs. Uh, ours are a little bit bigger, you know, we're a little bit more towards the middle of the basin. We had more sea level to grow into, uh, whereas you guys up here on the bank, uh, your reefs don't grow quite as tall, they're a little bit wider. Um, this talk, less about exploration, more about production. And what I'd like to present to everybody here today is how uh, a colleague of mine and myself are uh, combining a ton of Michigan data, uh, well logs, production data, uh, geology, uh, all this data into uh, a large database that can be mined and uh, we can use machine learning techniques uh, just to start narrowing in on, on some of these uh, exploration plays and also increasing production from existing uh, wells and reservoirs. You know, we all know that subsurface data, and I know the library here talks a lot about this, it's in many different formats, and it is hard to sort of assess relationships between geology, production data, uh, well log data, uh, and the like, seismic data too. So let's build a composite database that combines well and field scale data all into one place that's very easily accessible. Uh, we'll go over an overview of the databases and the data types, give a few examples. Uh, and then we're gonna look at three different reef reservoirs in Michigan. Uh, one's gonna be, or two are gonna be in the northern part of the state, one in the southern part of the state. Overview of the database that we have put together. What I'd like to point out is that, so this header data, this is available from the state via our website. Things like, you know, permit number, lease names, company, field name, you know, a, a, ton, a ton of data here. Uh, 85,000 rows of this data. Uh, our log data sampled at a, a quarter foot, sorry about the uh, US convention there, a quarter foot sample rate. We have uh, about 40 million rows of this data that we can mine through. Uh, production data going back to the early 1980s, we have over two million months of production data for different wells. Uh, and then also TOPS data, which is partly from the state and partly from our own research. I was inspired by Ian's uh, very cool poster, uh, the library's very cool posters, uh, doing their major Ontario oil, uh, oil and gas play atlas. So we decided to quickly just throw up some numbers here from Michigan in a similar fashion, although certainly not as nicely formatted, um, to give you an idea of what our production looks like relative to Ontario's for these different plays. Uh, our Niagara play is our biggest play. Uh, and again, all this data was mined from our database in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, you know, there's some quality checking that certainly has to occur when you're mining large amounts of data. But the fact that you can pull this data up, you know, in a couple days uh, with just a few lines of code is, you know, it's, it's pretty cool and can sort of help at least start you down the path of exploring and maybe enhancing production on some of these fields. An another simple thing that we can do with this large database is just, you know, through our production data is query out uh, top wells in terms of production, uh, one line of code to create a graph. And so, you know, you can create thousands and thousands of graphs without having to click and drag and, and, do, and do all these different things that you may have to do in Excel. We can really start to look at the data fast and efficient. Uh, here's another uh, query, filter, whatever you want to call it that we did. We quickly calculated all oil and gas ratios for these Niagara wells, plotted them up. We saw that these first two wells looked like they got water flooded uh, later on. This one up here increased production a little bit. Uh, this one was pretty unsuccessful. Uh, but then we can easily say, okay, run that same query, but also put some uh, a minimum water filter. So we don't want to see 
wells that have been water flooded. We want to see wells that had high oil gas ratios that haven't been water flooded. And now these two wells here, very much just example wells, but could, could become potential targets for a water flooding activity. Um, geologist by training. So this is what I've spent most of my career uh, thinking about, publishing, uh, all this stuff. Uh, as I've tran uh, transferred into the industry and, and actually a practicing geologist, I don't do quite as much of this anymore, but uh, we are finding it very useful to take a geological understanding and combine it with our production and our engineering data. You know, I, th I think that's a big uh, gap that we need to build a bridge over. And I think having all this data in one place really helps with that. Here's, I'll just talk quickly on this because we do throw a couple stats up uh, and, and you may want to have this knowledge. So this is how we characterize our Niagara and Pinnacle reefs in Michigan. Uh, we look at logs, we look at nearby wells, and, and what we'll initially do is uh, come up with thicknesses for each of these wells and we'll, and we'll give them a number. And that number corresponds to a, a facies or a, a depositional location. Uh, really just bodies of reservoir that share similar properties that we can sort of group together and uh, model, uh, run simulations on, you know, whatever it is. This is where the geological sort of model starts. Uh, we've looked at a lot of modern examples and uh, this sort of holds true for areas like Turks and Caicos, uh, other sort of pinnacle uh, reefs. In, in present day. And so what we see is we have this green uh, outline here that we call the reef core. That's bound stone, coral, uh, big reef building organisms that can really build a tall structure. Uh, and, and those get deposited in place and later uh, fluids come and, and leach, leach those organisms out and you're left with the super buggy, big fractured reservoirs that are so prolific in Michigan. On the west side, we generally see this blue body here is what we call the reef apron. So as these uh, corals and organisms were growing up in this green area, you know, storms and waves were continuously uh, in the area, crashing against them. And you just really get fragments, transported material, finer grain material out here on the west side. On this east side, you'll see this little purple uh, body we call that the reef talus. It's like a, a rubble or a conglomerate. So this is where the, the highest energy would have been. You start uh, slamming waves and, and storms into, into these corals and you, and you basically get them just falling off, uh, these big chunks just falling off right next to the reef. And, and these little purple bodies here can be hundreds and hundreds of millidarcies of permeability with super connected fractures and bugs and really prolific wells if they're drilled in this area. We've built this model on uh, this field right here. It's Columbus 3 field. Um, all the green dots have core. And I, I just, I can't even begin to express how without the core, you know, you just can't sort of build these models. It's just too much interpretation. If you have a complete section of these cores uh, is what we built this model off of. And we've taken it to other reefs too, done a similar workflow and been able to categorize them like this. Um, and so going back into our big database, now we can take any of the facies picks that we've made, uh, any of that information and start pulling out the data uh, within these zones. So uh, you can see the number of samples per uh, zone there, uh, and, but you can easily quickly pull out porosity permeability statistics from our core analysis data. Uh, we can quickly pull out production statistics for these different zones. and you know, as you start pulling this data in and start comparing it to, you know, your geological understanding and what you think you may know, does the data agree with the model? Uh, and, and you can begin that iteration of really trying to understand the details of these very complex systems. And you can see some of these average cumulative oil production numbers are all fairly high, all about half a million barrels. But you do see these leeward distal aprons and these leeward toes of slope on that windward side with a finer grain material do on average, based on these samples, produce less uh, oil and gas. Again, sort of enhancing production is, is sort of the theme here. So 
one of the queries that we ran on the data was that we summed all the production up prior to 2000 and calculated the difference uh, between that number and post 2000. So basically what it gave us is wells that increased productivity sort of later in life. The 2000 years a bit arbitrary, but just based on uh, Michigan Basin uh, development timeline, this kind of works out for the Niagara wells. And it did lead us to wells that did produce pretty well to begin with and had re-stimulation, re-entry, uh, horizontal wells put in and increased production later in life. So here are the three fields we're gonna uh, work around the basin with. And I know maybe a lot of you aren't too familiar with uh, the Michigan Basin here, more familiar with yours, but uh, we're gonna start up here in Presque Isle County, look at this reef. This, you know, this purple outline, these are all the known discovered reefs in Michigan. And you can see how they certainly uh, are part of your guys' Ontario play. Again, this being the sort of middle of the basin, we do get uh, a little bit bigger, taller reefs uh, in our state. Uh, then we're gonna go over here to the northwest side of the state and we'll end it down here in the south. So again, every field we go to, we try to develop our sort of geological model based on those facies, bodies that I was uh, describing earlier. Um, in the starred wells in this map are the ones that we're gonna look at as a successful reentry. So here, uh, again, is a production profile. Uh, this is a reef talus well. It's kind of right to the north of the reef crest, but in the reef talus. So you can see early on had really high uh, production. You're looking at you know upwards of 10,000 barrels. Again, this is monthly, 10,000 barrels a month. You started this decline. Uh, and then you had this event right here where you increased production. And, and this was going back into this vertical well and kicking off two lateral legs. Within, uh, we, we have scripts that we can run on this production data to sort of filter out this early on transient data. It actually au will automatically grab this decline, plot that decline, fit a curve to it, and then we can get our sort of uh, estimated ultimate recoveries on these. Uh, another well, this is a reef apron well, uh, was drilled, had really fast decline. I believe this was a reperf here. Um, again, a pretty fast decline. And then they did re-enter it with those horizontal wells. And you can see that the decline slowed uh, significantly. And again, we, we ran these statistics that I'll summarize uh, in the last slide. Uh, same story here. This is a reef crest well. So actually had a little bit lower initial production, you know, lower being certainly a relative term. Uh, 4,000 barrels per month it was producing, started declining. I believe this was a reperforation. Again, started declining. And then they re-entered it with two horizontal legs and you can see the increase that they got there. So here's that summary slide I, I told you I'd show. So uh, the tenant state Alice 224, that was that reef, the first one, the reef talus. Uh, again, using those curve fitting functions, we calculated that original estimated recovery and then calculated what the re-entry recovery was. So this was that initial decline and this was after re-entry on all of these. So basically when you crunch all this data, you kind of can get some relative percentages of what you could expect to increase production by if you went into a vertical well and, and drilled a couple uh, horizontals. Uh, Wexford 6, this is on that north uh, west side of the state. So this is one that we figured out some data from that previous field for those vertical wells and found similar vertical wells that hadn't been re-entered with horizontal wells as sort of a prospect play. And I go through the same wells here again with the model, uh, looking at these different facies, fitting the decline curves, calculating the EURs. And so then what we can do is say, okay, here was the original recovery. Based on our curve fitting, here was the estimated ultimate recovery from the vertical wells. Using those percentages that we calculated from the last field, we can apply those to the original EUR and sort of you can run your economics on this to see if it's worthwhile to drill, you know, an $800,000 million uh, horizontal well. Here's just kind of a, you know, the proposition of, we just created a, a quick static 3D model and sort of simulated where we would go uh, with this re-entry into this reef tailless well.
again, this is moving to the south of the state. Again, same Niagara Reefs, same sort of depositional models. And again, it was just using uh, a similar query that we found for the other fields to, to hone in on this field and say that this is a potential re-entry candidate. Same workflow here. What we found is that this Ingham 12 reef that we were looking at, we weren't even considering this Ingham 13 reef. This Ingham 12 reef had, uh, when, when we ran the uh, estimated ultimate recovery numbers, it was way higher than, uh, than what they got out of it, so we were pretty excited. When we looked at this Ingham 13 reef, it was almost identical cumulative recovery as what we estimated, so now we got really excited. Uh, but there's always something else with the geology in the reservoir, and what we found is that the water contact in this field was much higher than in this Ingham 13 field, which would cut our estimated recovery by about half and didn't look quite as enticing. So using that data, uh, we calculated these potential re-entry URs. That's it. Uh, we can conclude with, yeah, again, all this subsurface data, production data, tops data, geologic data, a lot of different formats. Um, we're working on ways to compare these relationships. Uh, great potential for increasing production with relatively low cost sidetracks um, without additional costs of CO2 flooding or water flooding. Uh, future applications, we'd like to look through a lot more of this data to develop tight decline curves for certain wells, certain facies. Again, just uh, combining and assessing all these relationships between the data. Uh, and then eventually we, we are starting to shoot some seismic data, so bringing that into the fold as well. So with that, I'll uh, end, and thanks everybody for your time.